All right, so all men know God. There is a general knowledge of God, even though that leads to the paradox of saying that unbelievers are believers. Unbelievers believe the truth about God. But now, does that mean that you can have a conversation out on the surface, if you will, back to the pool analogy, above the level of the water? You have a conversation with an unbeliever, and he or she is just going to clearly understand your theology and agree with it and so forth? No. They should, and they could, but they won't. So you can't have a conversation and expect the unbeliever to understand the trinity or predestination so because in their heart of hearts they know these things. Now they do know these things. Does that surprise you? I think we have a tendency to read Romans 1 and to say, well, everybody has some general idea about God. That there is a God somewhere, somehow, of some sort. That isn't what Paul says, though. Paul says that they know the living and true God. And they know him in all of his glory. They know his everlasting Godhead. They know God for who he truly is. And the Bible tells us they are without excuse. See, they can't say, well, I had this general idea that there was a divine power somewhere. They will be held accountable. They will be before God without excuse for not believing the truth about him. And the God that I'm talking about is not just any God, not a supreme being or some force out there in the universe. I'm talking about the personal sovereign, triune God revealed to us in the scriptures. Paul says, knowing the God, that's what it says in Greek, nantes ton theon, knowing the God, not a God, some kind of God, we'll get around to defining this God later, knowing the living and true, the one and only God, knowing God, they won't admit it. The question is then, does the unbeliever believe in God? Does the unbeliever believe? The answer to that question is, yes, he does. He believes that the living and true God is. But he does not believe that he believes it. And that's where the self-deception comes in. He believes it, but he doesn't believe that he's such a person that believes in God. But we say of him, on the basis of God's revelation, he does believe in God, but he doesn't believe that he does. And he sincerely does not believe that he does. Okay, so that's what we call self-deception. Now, the natural tendency is to model self-deception on other deception. Deceiving oneself is thought of as a version of deceiving someone else. A problem here, of course, is that in other deception, the roles of deceiver and deceived are incompatible. 
Yet in self-deception, a person is thought to play both of these incompatible roles himself. Let us stop and analyze the situation. In a case of other deception, Jones is aware that some proposition is false. But Jones intends to make Smith believe that it is true, and he succeeds. Now, if we take Smith out of the picture altogether and substitute in Jones everywhere we mentioned Smith just a moment ago, so as to gain self-deception, we end up saying, Jones, aware that P is false, intends to make himself believe that P is true and succeeds in making himself believe that P is true. Such a statement surely puzzling, for it suggests that somebody could try to make and succeed in making himself believe something which X hypothesis at the same time he believes not to be true. It would be easy to conclude then self-deception is an incoherent enterprise which cannot be fulfilled. And so we're forced to ask whether there actually is such a thing as perpetrating a deception on oneself. How could it occur in practice? How could it be described without contradiction? How can someone after all believe P as deceived yet disbelieve P as deceiver. And now appears that self-deception, despite the familiarity of the notion, is about as difficult as presiding at one's own funeral. Well, what can we do to find a solution to this paradox and rescue the presuppositional apologetics along the way? At this juncture, we can take the route of denying the reality of self-deception, or we can take the route of resolving the apparent paradox involved in the notion. My procedure will be to take self-deception as a datum, and thus I am committed to saying that at best it is only apparently self-contradictory. Unbelievers are secret believers. Unbelievers are secret believers. They know God. They've got the truth about God. The task of apologetics is therefore to strip the unbeliever of the mask that he's wearing, to show him that he has really known God all along but has been suppressing the truth unrighteously. But you have to understand that everyone knows God. And when someone becomes a Christian, it's not like, all of a sudden they've been introduced to God. Salvation, in a sense, is a matter of professing what you already know.